it just me or do people get murdered a lot nowadays? It seems like. I don't know if that's just me, but when I'm scrolling on the internet and stuff, every 10 posts is someone either A, getting murdered or B, something terrible happening. And then I just zone out. And I'm just like, all right, well, this sucks. I'm gonna go outside now and cut some wood. It's crazy though. People be people be hurting each other out there. It's it's wild. And in the age of technology, which we currently reside in, everyone has an HD fucking film camera in their back pocket. Except when trying to film UFOs or cryptids, obviously. It is a thing now where people just film interactions with each other in hopes that they will go viral. I'll be crying if I look like that too, bro. That's fucked up what they be doing to y'all. I ain't even gonna hold you, bro. I be saying that's fucked up like, bro, you probably had the full washing set. You should be fired probably if they ain't cut your shit. This is also the case when these types of interactions turn violent. People lose their composure. They get crazy. There's fist fights, whatever it may be. There's all kinds of content out there about that. What about content in which people are the worst possible thing a human being can be, which is a murderer, and they hide it very well. I've watched videos in regard to this first goober in our content today many times i've seen a lot of videos around stephen mcdaniel this guy you may have seen him you might even recognize his face you might have even seen some of the videos that i've seen there are a lot of viral videos about this guy it's crazy the subject of this episode is 25 year old stephen mcdaniel and to gain a deeper understanding of the foregoing components we have to extract certain elements through the knowledge of hindsight you might have seen him on the news getting interviewed by a news person nate lady or you might have seen him in a little holding room being interviewed by an investigator those videos always go viral regardless of where you've seen him you probably have seen him and if not well welcome to stephen mcdaniel and the incredibly disturbing story of how he tried to hide what he did i don't know anyone that would want to hurt her she was as nice a person as there is I, there will be one more person we're talking about in this video, by the way. Both of the people and stories we're covering in this video are incredibly interesting. The next one after Steven is just sick and disgusting and horrible. Steven was always the weird neighbor in his apartment complex, Barristers Hall, a 16-unit complex which housed law students from Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. Founded in 1873, Mercer School of Law was one of the first law schools in the nation. We were also the first ABA accredited law school in Georgia. Pretty quaint, pretty humble, pretty nice, a lot of beige, cool looking red doors, dude. Red doors fucking freak me out. That's how you get into hell, I think. Stephen was a graduate of of the Mercer Law School along with his fellow classmate and Barrister Hall resident Lauren Giddings. Stephen didn't have that many friends, but he always got along with Lauren, and Lauren was nice to him, which probably drew him around her and caused him to pay her more attention than other people in his life. Stephen had asked her out on a date within six months of their acquaintance, which was reportedly only the second time they had ever spoke. On June 27, 2011, friends and family of Lauren stopped hearing from her, and they realized she was missing on the 29th of June that same year. She was reported missing officially on the 30th, and when the local news found out, WGXA, they sent a crew to Barristers Hall where they conducted an interview with Stephen McDaniel. This guy, very creepy guy, very bizarre, very odd. The interview provides a glimpse inside the mind of a killer as he builds his story and his alibi. Take a look. Person that was living there? Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. It's important to set the stage a little bit here. Prior to the interview, this was not widely known yet, but Lauren Giddings' body had been found. At the start of the interview, Stephen shares with the interviewer that Lauren was his neighbor, and he's just trying to figure out where she is since no one has seen her. He also shares that the last time anyone had heard from Lauren was an email she had sent, and that was all there was. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and no one's heard from her since. Did you see her hang out with anyone at the time or anything like that? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, you always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. The interviewer then asks Stephen what kind of person she was, and he describes her as nice as can be, very personable, and very much a people person. All very kind things to say about a fellow human being. Then comes our first bizarre red flag. The interviewer asks Stephen if he knew if she had any enemies. He scrunched up his face kind of weird and said no. But instead of elaborating as to why she doesn't have any enemies, he goes back to the line and says, we don't know where 
where she is and then offers an explanation saying, The only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Now, that being said, it's a plausible explanation. Okay, that does make sense. It happens. People get snatched all the time out running. And that would be an even more plausible explanation if a part of her body hadn't been discovered in a trash can near Barrister's Hall. He continues talking to this point and says that he went over to Lauren's apartment with one of their mutual friends who had a key and they didn't find anything amiss. They went inside. It didn't look like anyone had broken in. It seemed normal. We went at, we went over. One of her friends had a key. We went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss, but I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it. So there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. And this is when it all came crashing down. You get to see this man realize that something horrible is about to happen to him. You get to see his face change as he realizes the jig is up. The interviewer asked Steven if they'd looked in the parking lot at all since her body had been discovered in a trash can nearby. And that is the first time that Steven hears that Lauren has been found. What about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Um, body? Upon hearing that Lauren had been found, you can tell the man appears visibly upset. He stops responding to the WGXA reporter, maybe because she's a friend of his and he's realizing, oh, she's not just missing, she's actually passed away and she had been so nice to him. Maybe he was saddened to hear of her death. But no, actually, it's because he murdered her. He tells the reporter that he needs to sit down after not being able to respond to multiple questions. And then he walks to a nearby bush to take a seat. What a fucking weird video this is. It makes me incredibly uncomfortable. I don't know if this is him trying to appear like a concerned neighbor or if it's just him realizing that the jig is up, that he's fucked, that he's, he's gonna get caught. This is most likely a genuine reaction disguised as another. He is most likely feeling a sense of fear and shock over the fact a substantial piece of evidence has been discovered, yet he plays it off as a feeling of sorrow over the loss of his supposed friend. I, I don't know anyone that would want to hurt her. She was as nice person as there is. In spite of him trying to seemingly appear like a concerned neighbor, he was under police investigation because he was the only one of Lauren's neighbors who refused a search of his apartment. He allegedly gave reasons like, it's the lawyer in me and I'm just protective of my space to the police as reasons why they shouldn't be able to search his stuff. And it was at that time that the police were searching neighbors' apartments that the interview with WGXA was taking place. Everyone was outside, including Steven, curious how the investigation was going. Eventually, Steven did let one detective walk through his apartment, but only while he was there visible. That seems kind of suspicious if you ask me. Then comes July 1st, the following day after Lauren Lauren's body was found, or a part of her body was found, and the day that she had gone missing. Stephen went down to the police station to give a statement about Lauren, and the interrogation footage is absolutely haunting. In the reporter's interview with Stephen for WGXA, he's normal, he, at least relatively normal. He appears animated, he's got an inflection of his voice, he's, you know, using hand gestures. It's just sort of a normal thing. Then he finds out the body's been found, and he's like, and he carries that exact same energy to the police interrogation footage. Came down earlier tonight, me and you talked, all right. You don't have any weapons on you, do you? No. That's just you are. What's wrong? You know I'm Detective Patterson, right? Yes. Do you remember? Put your hands up here. You remember us talking yes. earlier tonight, right? Yes. You remember me earlier in the day? The human element of Steven is missing entirely. He's fucking still. It's so weird. He only moves when instructed, and he's only instructed at the very, very beginning. If you condense this down into one short video, it's two hours long. He just goes. That's the only difference. He doesn't move ever. There's even a part where the detective asks Steven to look at him while he's talking to him. Classic Southern person behavior. And he looks at him. And then from then on, the next two hours, he just like a demon, like an actual possessed creature. He's got his hands in his lap. He's instructed to put his hands on the table. He puts his hands on the table and then he never, ever, ever looks away or moves again for two hours. You can see the other normal people in the video moving, fidgeting, adjusting themselves because they're normal. And the man just turns his head to maintain eye contact and that is absolutely it. He's in there behaving like he's in low power mode. He only responds with, yes, no. I do not know. What kind of law do you want to go into? Criminal law? Yes. Civil? Is that what you want to do for a living? Yes. Okay. Are you almost finished? Yes. Okay. So you don't have too much more to do, right? No. All right. Are you going to st stay here in Macon? I don't know. 
Did you used to work at the district attorney's office in Macon? Yes. It's fucking weird. It's such a strange situation that even the detectives become frustrated with the limited responses. I need your help. Can you help me? I don't know. I need your help. I'm asking you as a friend for help. And by the way, it is important to make clear that at this point, they know that Stephen was the one that killed Lauren because his hair was discovered with Lauren's body. Here's a clip of them saying so. We got your hair with the body. How is that, Stephen? In the interrogation, the police investigators press Stephen about some other interesting things as well. Some of these things could be looked into a little bit further. For example, they tried to get him to confess by sympathizing with him, kind of siding with him, saying that he's been picked on, girls didn't respect him, but he's a good guy that did something and he feels bad. In cell moment. We just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell it. So you didn't look like a monster at the end. Cause you know what? I don't believe that you're a monster, Steven. I believe that you're a good guy. You've been picked on. Girls didn't show you the respect that you deserved. You did something stupid. And I believe you feel bad about it. And that's why you're all freaked out right now. They also questioned him about the multiple weapons that he had in his apartment. He had three guns, an AK and two handguns, along with a samurai sword and a knife. What kind of pistols are you on? EAA witness, full size and compact. Okay. What is that? What about the one that was on the bed? That's the full size. That's the full size one? Where's the, what was the other one? The compact. Where was that at? On the table by the bed. And then you had that samurai sword? Yes. That was just a, I mean, that's not, is it an expensive sword or is it just a no. knockoff? It's just one of the knockoff swords. Yes. So why are those things important for the police to bring up in this investigation? Well, it seems as though Stephen was a man who had a lot of attitudes, a lot of mindsets that are indicative of a violent incel. He would share these in online chat rooms, particularly Operator Chan, an online chat room, thinking he was fairly anonymous despite an obvious link between himself and his online identity. Back in 2008, he would send out an email to the entire student body of the Mercer Law School proposing a political hypothetical, which is not important to the fact that he murdered this woman, but it's relevant to what we're discussing because he would sign out this email with, sincerely, Stephen McDaniel, true born son of liberty. Oh, so he's based. No, he would actually be mocked by his classmates for this. To the true born son of liberty, fellow with an IQ level slightly above room temperature, unsubscribe me also. That's not very nice. Apologies to those inconvenienced. Sincerely, Stephen McDaniel, true born son of liberty. Well, it was pretty important for him to say that. Apparently, it was part of his kind of brand, I guess. An account that was linked to Stephen named SOL. I wonder what that could stand for, would be found to have posted some very disturbing things on Operator Chan. In 2010, the account SOL would post on Operator Chan about how he'd handle religious demonstrators who would protest a fallen soldier's funeral. By the way, Operator Chan is no longer an operating website, but here are transcripts of what he said. The post that Stephen McDaniel made on Operator Chan details how he would slaughter everyone and how he'd behave after the fact to get away with it. And by God, it's very strange. Afterwards, I'd remain in this state for at least a day. No talking, no communication, blank, unfocused stares. I do not fall asleep either. Eventually, when some new stimulus is introduced, a family member I haven't seen, a picture of my brother or something like that, I shake my head from side to side, blink rapidly and look around in a panicked manner asking where I am, what's going on, if my family is okay, why I'm there, and when they ask, I'd say I have no memory of anything that happened after I arrived at the service. They probably initiate charges, at which point the family will need to get a lawyer to argue that I had no knowledge of my actions and were not acting of my own volition when I acted. Keep the story consistent, and whenever I am asked about what happened, I look down and put a sad look on your face, relating what I was told happened, as you have no memory of it, I might end up institutionalized for a while so they can try to figure out what caused the blackout. And they may take my guns from me as well as the ability to purchase more, but if I stuck to the story, it's doubtful I'd end up in prison. Very odd. SOL, aka Sons of Liberty, aka Stephen McDaniel, was confirmed as Stephen McDaniel because he posted a photo of himself with Justice Clarence Thomas to Operator Chan. His face was whited out in the photo to maintain his anonymity, but he made another post about his sister, and there were details confirmed by Stephen McDaniel's mother, Glenda. Big giant L, idiot boy. The Telegraph interviewed Stephen McDaniel's mother, Glenda, and she talks about the call that she received from Stephen while he was being investigated by the police. We can see him employing the same exact tactic that he had 
detailed under the pseudonym Sons of Liberty on Operator Chan with the soldier's funeral thing where he just says he doesn't remember anything that happened. And Steven, in an almost hypnotized, very flat voice said, They told me I did something bad. They told me I hurt someone. It's very important to note that Glinda believes Steven was framed in this, which is fucking wild. There are other Sons of Liberty posts, by the way, that are important on the Operator Chan forum website, whatever the fuck it was. And they no longer exist, to be clear, following the deletion of the website, but they are detailed in local news articles for making. He talked about chloroform and inhalable drugs used for incapacitating people. You want to select a compound that will act quickly once inhaled at rendering someone unconscious or at least compliant. Last for a long enough period of time that you can secure them for your work and not cause them to either feel nothing for an extended time or to suffer catastrophic organ failure before you can do your work. We'd also talk about his failures in romance. Incel. The problem with being a social recluse with a fundamental disability to connect on a romantic level is that we want so much to find that one special person with whom we'd want to grow old with to raise children with to spend the rest of our lives with and yet we're incapable of going out and finding her hey, Anthony, 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 shut up you're a murderer you fuck so knowing all of these details about steven and the things that he posted while believing he was anonymous how exactly did he kill Lauren Giddings? We mentioned very briefly earlier that pre-interview when the reporter was talking to Stephen, they had found a part of Lauren's body at the scene. But Stephen's confession lays out exactly how disturbed he truly is and ties in everything with what we've discussed up until now. He goes over every single step of the murder. He had possession of a master key for the apartment complex, which he used to gain access to her apartment. He wore a mask and gloves. He watched her sleep until she woke up when the floor creaked as he stepped towards her. He then strangled her to death and dragged her body to the bathtub. He spent the next day, Sunday, just on his computer and returned that night with a hacksaw to dismember her body. He wrapped the various parts of her body in trash bags and disposed of half her body in the dumpster across the street and her torso in the trash can nearby. Her torso was discovered, the rest of her body was never discovered. The craziest thing about all of this is that Stephen wasn't even initially charged with murder. He was originally charged with burglary. And how that happened is that police had suspected him for the murder, along with all the other people who lived in that, you know, student living community. He obviously was the one who was refusing to let them come in and, and look inside of his home. And they didn't have anything concrete as far as evidence goes. So in the original statement that he gave to police, he reportedly admitted to having entered classmates' apartments to take condoms from them, admitting to burglary, essentially. This admission pointed the investigators at least in the right direction. And even before that, Stephen said in his news interview that Lauren thought someone had broken into to her apartment. She said that she she was afraid in her apartment that she thought that someone had tried to break in on Thursday night and she she was afraid to stay in there. Then they arrested him on those burglary charges and performed a more thorough search of his apartment and found the hacksaw that he had used on Lauren. This is a really crazy twist, by the way. They questioned him about possessing the saw. He would deny that. Do you own any saws or anything like that? No. There's not anything in your car, is there? No. In the trunk or anything? No. And then his mom confirmed and admit that he had the saw, but then decided to speculate that it was taken from his garbage and then used on Lauren and then framed Stephen. Wow. Apple doesn't far fall from the tree. Glinda is fucking delusional. Another disturbing addition to this is that during the search of Steven's apartment, they found a thumb drive with CP on it, which is, you know, I mean, if you really needed to make the guy seem worse, there you go. He received seven charges in regard to that and the exploitation of children. And the police also recovered deleted footage of Steven peeking into Lauren's apartment trying to film her sleeping. This guy's a fucking lunatic. Now we have all this. You have Glenda saying that he was framed, but we also have Steven's confession. That was part of a guilty plea deal to avoid the death penalty. By God, what a waste of taxpayer money. In 2014, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2041. Please no. Please don't do that. The footage of him in court is fucking creepy as shit. He's got crazy eyes. Dude looks like an absolute lunatic. No son of liberty I've ever seen. And since all this happened, he's tried to appeal his conviction several times because he's a lawyer. <laughs> Or he went to a law school or whatever. In 2018, he even represented himself like Saul Goodman trying to 
argue for a retrial. Stephen McDaniel walked into the courtroom today with an entire cart full of documents. Now, the morning got off to a bit of a slow start. He began by questioning Nancy Scott Malcor, who works with the district attorney's office. He asked very specific questions regarding court documents and transcripts of pretrial hearings. He claimed that he was not adequately represented by his attorneys and filed a malpractice complaint against his former attorney. That is so ironic. <laughs> Look at this article headline. Convicted murderer of Mercer Law, student files malpractice complaint against attorney. Dude, such a fucking loser. His old attorney, Buford, said that he doesn't feel that he offered him inadequate counsel considering the fact that Stephen admitted to brutally murdering and dismembering someone and still had the opportunity to get out with the possibility of parole in 2041. True. The same attorney believed that Stephen was innocent throughout the majority of the case until the footage of him peeping on Lauren surfaced and then the detailed confession was written. So I wonder what Glinda thinks. Stephen's father even tried launching a GoFundMe seeking justice. It didn't raise a single penny, which makes sense. How can your parents be so fucking dumb? Also, the judge denied his appeal, by the way. <laughs> he tried again in May of 2022 with a habeas corpus petition. He claimed that documents from his defense trial were stolen by a district attorney. He also reaffirmed his belief that he received ineffective counsel in 2014 for his trial. Bro's an idiot! Bro is still in prison and he's become infamous for his hubris and ridiculous levels of narcissism, believing that he could get away with the perfect murder. He went on the news, seemingly attempt to flaunt the lack of care for what he had done only when all of this backfired and his perfect murder fell apart completely and he's made a fool and now he's in jail forever so next we got this fucking guy you've probably seen this guy on twitter he's been going viral recently because he posted a youtube video in which he removed his father's head from his body i mean that's pretty much the the real only way to describe it the guy's got something very wrong with him mentally and it's absolutely messed up. This is Justin Moan. This particular story has gotten a lot of coverage recently because of the video being uploaded to YouTube. It's absolutely disturbing and, and horrible. Do not watch it. Just into CNN, we want to warn you, this is very disturbing. A Pennsylvania man was charged with murder and abuse of a corpse after police say he posted a YouTube video in which he claims to show his father's <laughs> head while ranting about the Biden administration and the border crisis. Justin is a person who is incredibly mentally ill and also a far right wing conspiracy theorist. He uploaded a 14 minute video called Moans Militia, Call to Arms for American Patriots. In the video, he calls himself the commander of America's national network of militias and also gives a set of orders, which are crazy. All federal employees are to be killed on site. Also, he called for people to lay siege to FBI, IRS, ATF, police offices, and federal courts. Oh my God. He calls everyone traitors in the country and calls for state national guards to join their countrymen and fight alongside them against the federal government. He says that Joe Biden is no longer in power and that he's now the acting president of America under martial law. He offers bounties of $1 million for the heads of FBI directors, federal judges, and even gives out addresses to find people. Dude is fucking wild absolutely clinically insane. He shot his dad and removed his head from his body and uploaded a video showing it off while making this call to action. It's fucking ridiculous. His father was also a federal government employee. An incredibly tragic part of the story is that Justin's mother was the one to find the husband's body minus the head. When police arrived, they found the body, tools, but no Justin. He had fled the scene. Justin was caught 100 miles away and arrested only a few hours after the murder and after the video was posted. He had a 9 mil Sig Sauer handgun that was missing one round, presumably the round he shot his father with. He looks pretty happy, to be honest, but also not like he's doing well. He was arrested after breaking into a Pennsylvania National Guard facility and he told authorities that he'd gone there for the purpose of mobilizing the Pennsylvania National Guard to raise arms against the federal government, which is wild. This man, Justin Moan, was 32 years old. How can something like this happen only now? How can you make it to 32 being this unhinged and having these thoughts and it only, you know, comes to a head at age 32. I assume there was some kind of terrible underlying mental condition. That being said, the district attorney determined after all the evidence that they've collected that he was acting with a clear mind. And he's also proud of the consequences of his actions. One of the things we always look at is, is there go going to be a later claim of McNaughton insanity? Um, that is a very specific definition where somebody is unaware of the nature and, and consequences of their actions. Not that they're 
perhaps what the common term crazy is, but it is a very specific terminology. And I can state with the evidence we have uh, gathered thus far, this individual was acting with clear mind, aware of his uh, actions and proud of his consequences. He had no history of diagnosed mental health issues. There was no known instances of voluntary or involuntary commitments to any kind of psychiatric facility or hospital or anything. The dude was not crazy, according to the district attorney, Jennifer Scorn. But an interview with Justin's former roommate while they attended the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, Colorado. <laughs> During their time living together, Davis, Justin's roommate, said that he thought the internet was after him. That's all from a, an interview conducted by CNN. Even back then, he had very clear issues. He would always talk about how the government was out to get him. Who knows? Who knows what was wrong with the fella? Stevie McDaniel was 25 years old before he acted on his evil thoughts and incel inclinations. Justin Moan was 32 at the time of murdering his father and uploading the video to the internet. So I don't know, man. Be careful. Be safe, I guess. It's crazy. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. So anyways. Keep an eye out for your loved ones and people who seem a little bit unhinged. Be kind to them, but watch your back as well.